Well, welcome to Third City Online. My name is Parker. I'm one of three youth ministers here at Third City. And I just want to say you, as a Third City uh, family member, have been absolutely incredible. You have been so kind and so patient and so flexible and so generous. You have shown, even in all the stuff that you're going through, what the Third City family is made of. And we thank God for you. And for those of you who have just joined us for the first time over the last few weeks, maybe even today is your first time, I want to say you're brave for even clicking on a link that comes from a church. And second of all, you're safe here, you're welcomed here, and we want you here. And we are so confident in the reality that this is just not a number of a view count on a website, but that you're a human and you have a story And you have value. And we hope to hear that story someday soon, face to face. In the meantime, we're in a series called From Despair to Destiny. And we've been looking at how Abraham's story winds up and teaches us about our own experiences in life. God is leading Abraham to a place and a future that's miraculous, to say the least. But there's a lot of bumps along the way. Abraham has a nephew. His name is Lot who's a bit of a loose cannon, and he's gone off on his own route. and He's gotten caught up in a city that looks like Las Vegas times two on its worst day. And this place is about to be destroyed because of its wickedness. They're asking for it. And Abraham pleads with the Lord to spare his black sheep of the family nephew. God agrees. But the city is still going to get what's coming to it. So two angels head into the city to get Lot and his family out. The angels show up and find Lot sitting at the city gate, which means he's already made a name for himself in this wretched place. He's a leader of this this place and this group of people. And as they go in, the mob of the city has already objectified these guests to the point of not even wanting to know their names before they want to use them and abuse them for their own satisfaction. The situation is nearing a breaking point. I want you to think of the tension in the movie Argo. Like that's where we're at at this point. And dawn is about to break, and everything is about to change. So this is Genesis chapter 19, starting in verse 15. With the coming of the dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And he hesitated. And the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Remember that. The Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to him, No, 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 my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes. Obviously, you like me. You have shown me great kindness to spare my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. I won't make it there. The disaster will catch up to me. I'll die. Look, there's a, there's a little town off this way. I'll go there. How about that? I'm, I'm, he's wheeling and dealing already. I'll go there and then just don't kill me there. Surely my life will be spared. I imagine his wife going, Your life? Only your life? You know, like, I'm guessing there's some colorful language on the journey that's ahead. Or what I call a silent conversation. Might be happening. But he said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town that you speak of, but flee there quickly. Because I can't do anything until you reach it. And by the time Lot reached Zor, this is the little town that he ran to, the sun had risen over the land, and then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And thus he overthrew these cities and the entire plain, destroying all the living things in those cities and all the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Lot's life was spared. He received mercy. He received grace. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains. For he was afraid to stay in Zor. That's so interesting. He was afraid to stay in this place. So he and his daughters lived out their days in a cave, hiding. 
so interesting. When we read stories like this, we love to put ourselves in the roles that kind of shine, you know? Like, I, I'm most like Abraham. I spend most of my days praying for bums to make something of their lives, you know? It makes us feel good. But I'm looking at this passage over the last two weeks, and I'm starting to see how prophetic, how revealing it is about my story and me finding myself in Lot's position. And maybe that's like you more than not, too. Maybe you're running from a burning city. I know I ran from a burning city of doom and despair. I'm speaking in metaphor, of course, that all of us have burning cities, things that are killing us, addictions, things that we won't let die. And so we try to bring them with them or we stay where they're at. And I know we all have burning cities because Romans chapter 3 says, for we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us. Not a single one of us is right. And Romans chapter 6 says, for the wages of sin is death. There's only going to be death in this burning city. And the fatality rate of being a human being is still 100%. We need to run from our burning cities. It reminds me a lot of my story. And I think about the burning cities that I ran from. I was your stereotypical, prideful, egotistical, self-centered, bulletproof high school guy and had all the baggage that came along with that. And funny enough, I actually got a job here at Third City at Connect at the after school program. And the guy that we're affirming to come back to staff was actually the first guy to hire me here at Third City. Andrew was. And then while I was working here, Josh Sykes, the other youth minister that I work with now, invited me to our youth group every week for two years. And I said, no, thank you. I just wasn't interested, you know. Like, I was never an atheist. I knew at some point God was going to deal with me and I was going to have to face him. But I was just putting it off. I didn't want that accountability. And so I kept playing the game. I kept living in the burning city. And then I eventually found myself going on a CSF mission trip. It's a Christian student fellowship. It's a campus ministry that we just love. And we were on our way to Las Vegas. And I tried to get out of it literally in every way possible. I said, I don't have money. I'm a broke college kid. I can't go. One phone call was made in Third City, paid my way. It is literally incredible how Third City has been woven into my story of redemption. You wouldn't believe it. I wish I could tell you all the stories. But when I get to Las Vegas, and Las Vegas gets knocked a lot, and I don't, I don't want to cast shade the whole time on this. Like, there's incredible people there, and there's some incredible ministry happening there too. And what better place for ministry to happen? But when you go to a place like Las Vegas and you see the underbelly of it all, what gets chewed up and thrown into the alleyways of Las Vegas, I've been pretty sheltered in my life. And I realized that evil is very real. And maybe you've seen the same kind of thing that made you go, evil is very real in this life. And I had a breakdown slash breakthrough where I realized if evil is this real, the opposite has to be true. I wouldn't be able to tell darkness from darkness if there wasn't light. I wouldn't know that I would, I wouldn't expect any different from evil, right? I wouldn't expect that women and children be treated differently if all there ever was was evil. So the opposite had to be true to me. That's my personal story. That the light was just as real as the dark. And so I started running from my burning city. I started running towards a place of mercy and I was tripping and falling all the way there. I looked like a fool, I'm sure. But as I was running, my wounds started to heal. And some of you know what I mean. And as I was running, pain started turning into purpose. And I was convinced that I had to spend the rest of my life helping punks like me know that the light is just as true as the dark and that a savior is just as real as death. I don't know what your story is. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know if you ran from your burning city 20 years ago or if you're sitting in one right now. I don't know what'll make you run. I don't know what'll wake you up. Maybe it's a near death experience. I don't know. Maybe it's a death of a loved one. Maybe it's something a friend of yours said to you that you didn't you wanted to ignore but you finally accepted. Maybe you're just waking up in this pandemic world going, there has got to be more to life than eating, sleeping, and dying. There's got to be more. I don't, I don't know what your story is. I hope to hear it someday. But as I'm running, 
the next few months, as I'm trying to like get towards this place of mercy, it's a narrow road as I'm running from my burning city. This, this piece of scripture helped me so much. And this is a paraphrased version in the message, but it speaks, it just sings to what I was going through. And maybe you too. These are all warning markers, danger in our history books. Talking about these stories like Lot and, and the flood and all these different stories written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our position in the story are parallel. They're at the beginning, we are at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anybody else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have faced. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. He will always find you in your burning city and he will show you the way out. He will help you escape and he will show you the road to run on. So my very dear friends, when you see people reducing God to something they can use or control or ignore, get out of their company as fast as you can. Run for your life. Will you run? Will you run from your burning city? Will you run? I was talking to a buddy of mine, kind of working through this, because this scripture is like, this is chewy, this is heavy. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of running from burning cities and what that looks like in our lives. And he goes, you know, I think I, think I ran from burning cities three times in my life. But because I didn't know what I was running to, I went straight back to the burning city. The place that my life was getting torn apart, the addictions that I was trying to hide, the lies that I was keeping behind closed doors. I kept going back. And so I think the most important part of any of this, yeah, sure, we all have burning cities, but here's the most important part, I think. What are we running to? And here's where this story can really show us a way. You have three options. You can run back to the burning city. You can skip the place of mercy that you experienced and then go your own way, completely, completely letting go of the responsibility you have to your family and the accountability you have to God, the God who saved your hide from that hellfire anyways, and you go and run and hide in a cave. Or three, you run to a place of mercy. Option number one, Lot's wife shows us. I don't know what had her in that city. I don't know what hooked her heart. I don't know if she couldn't let dead things die. I don't know if she felt like she had control back there in that burning city. I don't know if she felt more comfortable living in a city that she knew was going to burn down than actually trusting the grace of God. I don't know. And I don't know if she just looked over her shoulder and boom, pillar of salt, or I don't know if she actually went all the way back. Look at this scripture in Luke 17. This is Jesus talking about like death, burial, resurrection, I'm coming back. That's what he's talking about here. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building and doing whatever they wanted but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And it'll be just like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on their housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in a field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever tries to hang on to dead things on this run, they'll lose it but whoever loses their life will preserve it. Let dead things go. Let them burn. This is 2 Peter chapter 2. It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness at all than to turn their backs on it. I guess the proverb's right. A dog will return to its vomit. A washed pig will go right back to the mud. Will you run back to the burning city? 
And there's just one more point I want to make here. And this might, this might be so pertinent to what you're going through right now, especially in this time. You might be going through the most stress, the most anxiety, the most depression, the most anger, the most frustration, confusion, tension in your home, whatever you are going through right now. Don't give up too soon. Lot's wife was steps away from God delivering her from hellfire. She gave up too soon. Trust in the grace and the promises of God. Don't give up too soon. Option number two, the cave. This is a hard, hard piece that, I, uh, that really wrung my heart this week. Um, Lot went to this city and it said he was afraid to be there. That's like saying the mob boss is afraid of going to Gibbon. You see what I'm saying? Like he was the, one of the kingpins in Sodom and Gomorrah, worthy of destruction. It was a bad place. And he comes to a little town and he's afraid to be there. I don't know. Maybe that fear wasn't necessarily of the people there. Maybe that fear was his shame or was his guilt. Or maybe the feeling like whatever this is, I can't trust it. I need to go on my own. Lot wasn't stupid. He's a manipulator. He's very cunning. He worked his way up in a very short time in a rough city. He's been manipulating this whole time. And he's not an atheist. He turned to angels and literally said, Ah, I'm your servant. I understand. You're really great. Thanks for sparing me. Gives them credit for what they do. And yet he goes to a place of mercy and thinks, You know what? I'm out. This whole trusting grace and mercy thing makes me uncomfortable. I'm going to go hide in a cave for the rest of my life. I'm going to go run from the responsibilities that I have to my family and the accountability that I have to the God that saved me. I'm going to go run to a cave. We have caves, don't we? Some caves are 1,100 square foot. Some caves are 7,500 square foot. Some caves have a half-built transmission in them with tools on the wall. Some caves have perfectly curated 90s Husker memorabilia in them. Some caves have a desk with our name placard on it. Some caves live within the world of a glowing screen. Now hear me. These things aren't wicked on their own. But when they're where you run to hide from your responsibility to your family and your accountability to God, that is a wicked place. And look at Lot's daughters. That's all you have to see to know that this is true. Why? Because Lot runs, hides in a cave, gives up the responsibility he has to his daughters, accountability to God. And his daughters are so desperate. If you read on in this story, so desperate and so abandoned that they feel like they're the only ones who are going to fight for their future. And so they go and they make stupid decisions because their dad was hiding in a cave. How many daughters are living that life right now? How many sons? Because their mom and dad are hiding in a cave. They're trying to survive out here. I don't know if this is just my youth ministry heart. For half a decade, I've heard these stories. They're just trying to survive out here. Do you imagine being 15 right now? Mind-destroying porn a swipe away. Every bully in school can get to you through every communication device you ever owned. You can't hide. And then we get mad at them when they mess it up. What do we expect? I don't know in how many conversations I've been in. Whether it's a middle schooler, whether it's a 20-year-old, or whether it's a 30-year-old man, no matter what's happening in school or online or at work, at the bottom of it all, they just want their dad. They just want their daddy to notice them. They just want their mom to tell them that they love them, that they're proud of them. They would kill for your attention kill for it. They would kill for half the amount of attention that your cave gets. They would kill for half the amount of attention that your phone gets. 
they would kill for a slice of the attention that you give to your career. They want you. They don't want more stuff. They don't want a cave of their own. They want you. This is Youth Ministry 101 gold I'm about to give you. If you have a kid around, tell them to go get a cheese stick or something. I'm going to give you something beautiful here, okay? I would say it's 90% foolproof. You don't have to be cool. You have to care. You don't have to be incredible. You have to be interested. So what if you don't care about Minecraft? Get over yourself. So what if you don't care about volleyball? Don't be so self-centered. Ask that kid two questions about what they're interested in. And you'd be half as interested in that as you are as the next sales pitch or Husker gossip. And you pay attention. And here's your golden phrase. Some form of this phrase. Tell me more about that. And you watch as your kid doesn't leave your side for the next 10 minutes. They want you. Will you run from your cave? Will you give up on this fight of hiding from your responsibility to your family and your accountability to your God that saves you? Listen, nobody's laying on their deathbed asking for them to bring pictures of their caves. Bring me pictures of my cars and my houses and, and my boats. Give me a pile of my stuff. No, they are calling to try to get people there so that they might have the chance of murmuring a shadow of the love that they should have given 40 years ago. You don't have all the time in the world and you're not getting it back. Don't waste it. And this pandemic might be giving you the biggest shot and opportunity at redemption that you ever had because whether you like it or not, the kids are home. You're home. Don't miss it. Jane and I are walking around our neighborhood the other day and it's been like a month since we've been just walking the same route and she goes, have you ever seen so many dads out with their families? I said, never. I've never seen anything like this. Dads out playing catch with their kids, teaching their daughters how to ride bikes. Oh, how heartbroken they would be if everything went back to normal. And listen, I'm writing to myself too. Because I'm writing this and I'm thinking, the day I become a father, I'm going to be overjoyed and I'm going to be terrified. Because I'm well aware of the insecurities of I, I've had. And I'm well aware of where I feel like I've fallen short as a man. And I'm well aware of the things that I hate about myself well aware but I wrote something down that I know is true and I know God wanted me to hear maybe he wants it, you to hear it too and it's this listen to me God gives you everything you need to be a man God gives you everything you need to be a dad God gives you everything you need to be a mom God gives you everything you need to be a guardian. He gives you everything you need. And he never gives up on you. How could you give up on them? Love never gives up. Option three, a place of mercy. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Leave it in the burning city and run and that means killing off everything connected with the way of death, sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like doing it and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings and caves and burning cities. Not a God of mercy. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger, but it wasn't long ago that you were doing all this stuff and not knowing any better, but you know better now. So make sure 
It's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Listen, you have the opportunity to run from that cave and to run from that burning city and run to a place of mercy. I think Lot left this place of mercy because he trusted guilt more than grace. I think he believed more in shame, not mercy. But listen, in this place of grace and in this place of mercy, in this kingdom of God, you can trust mercy more than shame. You can trust grace more than guilt. And start new. Here's the rest of the verses that I read at the beginning. Romans chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He runs into the cave. He runs into your burning city. And he takes your place through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Listen, anything that is dead that you are trying to bring on this run with you, leave it. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Leave it there. Because Jesus runs into your burning city. He grabs you by the hand and he shows you the way out and he says, head this way. I gotta go finish something. And he walks back into the burning city to take your place. The hellfire, hellstorm you deserve. And make sure that everything that should die, dies. So that he can with confidence say, it is finished. And you get a run. You get a run to a place of mercy to start a new life free of guilt, free of shame. Will you run? I have to remember my story all the time. Daily, I need to remember what I ran from, what I ran to, and what I found when I got there. This is why we take communion every week. So we can remember what we ran from what we ran to and what we received when we got there. Grace, mercy, love unlimited, resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. Pray with me. Jesus, help us have the courage to leave the cave where we're hiding from you, from our responsibility to our families, to the accountability we have to you. Help us see that you're a merciful God, just waiting, waiting to shower us with grace. Would you give us courage to run from a burning city that we know is going to kill us? We know it only brings death and destruction. And will you show us the narrow road to a place of mercy and grace where we could start new? It's in Jesus' name, amen. So the question is, will you run? Will you run from the burning city that's only bringing death and pain to you? Will you run from your cave that you're hiding, from your responsibilities to your family and your accountability to God? Will you run to a place of mercy? I know it'll look different in this season, but this is exactly what the church is for, is to remind you that you're not alone. We're all on the same journey. You're not alone. Even though you might be isolated right now, you're not alone. And we have incredible, incredible ministries and places for you to be that even right now might be virtual, I don't know. And for how long that'll be, I don't know, but they are specifically designed to put people in circles so that we can hear your story, so that you can hear other people's stories and know that you're not alone. Will you run? 
and we have so much to celebrate in the good news of Jesus Christ. Because those burning cities were our tombs. Those caves were our graves. But because of his grace and his mercy, we run free from them.